Hello and welcome to the Card Combo Show with me, Choker Billy, where we look at weird and wonderful card combinations in the Final Fantasy TCG. If you enjoy the video, make sure to like and subscribe. The videos we're looking at this week are Opus 12 Dusk, Opus 12 Diablos, Opus 12 Machinist, The Crystal Exile from Opus 12, <laughs> and Opus 5 Ramza. Let's get to it. Okay, so Dusk, he is an on-curve 3 CP 7k forward. When Dusk enters the field, you may pay one water. When you do so, play one forward of cost three or less from your hand onto the field. So there was a big focus in Opus 12 of just playing things for an extra ability. So you've got Magissa, Dusk, the Crystal Exarch, all these sorts of cards where they basically get you to pay stuff, or play stuff for free even. Uh, so, He's on curve, he's a decent card, he's a warrior of light as well, which is a bonus. Uh, so, Quistis, a card that was barely even played in Opus 2, but I love her because she's my final, favourite Final Fantasy VIII character. Yeah, I know I'm weird, deal with it. Uh, so, when Quistis enters the field, she can then bring in Dusk, you can then pay the one water from Dusk's, Dusk's ability to then bring in something else, which is fantastic. Uh, she also gives a little buff to... Um, to CP forwards or less as well, so if Dusk brings in a smaller forward, they can get a buff from Quistis as well. So effectively you're paying 6 CP to gain 3 forwards, which is pretty good. Strago! So, similar to Quistis, but a bit more effective, a bit more dependent on what your opponent's playing as well though. Thankfully, um, Dusk is a 3 CP forwards, and some of the most commonly played forwards are 3 CP or 4 CP. And Strago, he comes in, he bounces your opponent's forward, and then you get to play not only a forward, but a character of the same CP of which you bounce. So that's fantastic as well. So if you bounce one of your opponent's 3 CP forwards, he can then play a 3 CP backup, maybe a searcher, which is really good. But anyway, yeah, so you can play Strago, bounce your opponent's 3 CP forward, bring in Dusk, again, pay the one water to then bring in something else. So you've paid six, but you've now bounced something of your opponent's, and then you've also brought in three forwards, which is really, really good. Phoenix, so being able to cast Phoenix and bring in Dusk on your opponent's turn, but then also using Dusk's ability to bring something else in from your hand, and that forward can then block, which is great, because Dusk brings it in standing upright, uh, and obviously the Phoenix ability will be useful, but not only all this, it's the fact that Dusk then will be able to attack on your next turn as well. The Crystal Exarch for the first time in this video. Um, at the beginning of your main phase 2, during each of your turns, you may play one forward of cost equal to or less than the number of ice backups you control from your hand onto the field. So, he is dependent on the amount of ice backups you've got, but he can play a forward of any colour, which is fantastic. Now, obviously, putting something outside of ice would be a bit strange because with a card like him, depending on the amount of ice backups you've got, you're probably in mono ice. But if you want a little bit of spice in there and you maybe got one or two um, water backups, then you can bring in Dusk for free off the Crystal Exarch and then you can just pay the one water to bring something else in. So you're paying one CP effectively for Dusk and something else, which is really, really good. Wall. So not only does when Ol enter the field, he gets, he hopefully will search you a, um, or reveal a Warrior of Light card to your hand, but when he's put into the break zone, he can also bring a 3 CP Warrior of Light onto the field. So say for example, you already had Wall on the field, you cast Famfrit, so you put Wall into the break zone, your opponent puts one of their forwards into the break zone, you can then bring in Dusk, and then you pay one water to then bring in another forward as well, which is fantastic. I mean, you've gotten rid of one of your opponent's forwards and you've gained two forwards. Obviously, Wall's been put into the break zone, but it's pretty worth it, to be honest. Faris, so not only can Faris reduce the cost of Dusk, but if Dusk were to bring in more Warrior of Lights, then you can also get the ping ability as well. So, for example, you put Faris into the, well, you bring Faris into the field, you then make Dusk cost one, which is great. So effectively you're paying two to use his ability. Um, and then he comes in, maybe he's gonna make the next forward cost less, or maybe just gonna deal some damage, at which point it will be um, four CP because of Faris and Dusk. And then if Dusk brings in another Warrior of Light, then that will then be 6K, which is really good. That's a total of, um, what, 10k to what I've paid two for Dusk and the other forward? That's really, really good. 
and Orianja. So this works excellently with Strago I mentioned earlier. I actually had a, these guys in a deck and I managed to get this off and I was so happy about it. So you play Strago, you bounce your opponent's 3 CP forward to bring in Dusk, you then pay the one water to then bring in Orianja to bounce another of your opponent's forwards. And with Orianja I brought in, I believe it was the Black Knight or Dark Knight, whatever they're called. And that then means that if your opponent wants to play a forward of 4 CP or less, it's going to get broken by it. So it really puts your opponent in a difficult position. You can also bring in something like Electric Jellyfish, so you can give either Dusk or Orianja haste and dull something out of the way as well, which is great. But for paying what is effectively 6 CP for Strago, Dusk and Orianja and Black Knight, that is some incredible value. Okay, so Diablos. Choose one forward. If its power has been increased or decreased, break it. So one of the reasons I like this card so much is the fact that it's one of Wind's only outright breaks. They have got, obviously, the 5 CP Diablos, which can break anything of 5 CP or greater, but that's fairly limited. And there's lots of ways to both be able to increase power or decrease power, and then use Diablos to just finish off the forward. So... Beatrix. Obviously, Beatrix can attack your entire your opponent's entire field, then loses power. You can then cast Diablos to be able to break it. And what's great about Beatrix is that it's a it's a board wide effect. So it doesn't matter if you've, they've got any sort of lightning rod, that will then have its power reduced, and hopefully Diablos can then finish it off. If they've got the likes of Felthanos, obviously that will then force Diablos to target that and cancel it. But more on that later. Uh, similarly, Rain. Now, the reason I've got Beatrix and Rain in separate is the fact that obviously Rain can reduce your opponent's um, power as well, but it also increases your forward's power. And the good thing about Diablos is it's just choose one forward. So you can choose your own forwards if you want as well. So maybe you've got, I don't know, Dice Dog on your side, and when he's put into the break zone, choose one forward, deal at 7k. So you can attack with Rain, your opponent's or your opponent's forwards lose. 2000 power and then your dice dark has gained power you cast diablos to then break your dice dark and deal 7k to what was previously maybe a 9k forward maybe the fire strike garland 3 cp so he's a very annoying forward so being able to get rid of stuff like that is great and the outright break again with diablos is really good bunker beast so again maybe your opponent's got the 3 cp first strike 9k garland he's a massive pain to deal with uh but you just attack with a tiny little forward, they block, you then use Bunker Beast. Bunker Beast will reduce his power and then Diablos can then just outright break it. And all this happens before Garland gets to deal any damage. So it doesn't matter what forward you've got, because of the fact that the Bunker Beast and the Diablos come before damage resolution, you're good. And Ishtola, so obviously I'm, earlier I mentioned Fel Thanos and he can be really annoying to deal with. Um, obviously you attack with Beatrix minus 1000 power, then you go to cast Diablos, but he's going to cancel it. So then you use Ishtola to cancel his cancel ability, and you can then break him. Now, it might seem like a lot of an investment to scare off Felthanos, but Felthanos can debilitate your entire field sometimes. He can just completely stop you in your tracks. So the way I look at it is Ishtola, you've cast something to make Ishtola more powerful, and then the two have traded. That's what's happened, basically. So being able to just break Felthanos, just with a cast of Diablos and putting Ishtola into the break zone, I think is definitely worth it. And if you did do this in conjunction with something like a Beatrix attack, they, your opponent still has the Beatrix attack to contend with. Walt, so he's got the ability of just, as soon as you enter your main phase, you don't even have to attack with anything. You just, sorry, not main phase, attack phase. You, at the beginning of your attack phase, select up to two of the four following actions, and one of those is choose one forward, it gains plus 2,000 power until the end of the turn. So again, you can choose one of your opponent's forwards, so you're not even restricted to water or wind with the damage change, or the power change even. You can just choose one of your opponent's forwards, it gains plus 2,000 power, and then you cast Diablos to break it. And similarly with Vaan, you attack with Vaan, you can choose one forward, it can't block, and choose another of your opponent's forwards, it gains plus 2,000 power, you cast Diablos, and you break that forward. Obviously Diablos is really great with things like Lulu and Waka on your opponent's field as well, just if they've got those standard uh, elemental buffers, or any form of buffer, uh, Ovalia for Knights as well, if they have one of those down, then Diablos is going to be able to break nearly all of their deck, which is really, really good. Okay, Machinist. Now, Machinist is a weird one because it was one of the first cards to give a forward or to give your own cards an activated ability. Um, so it's when Machinist enters the field, choose up to two forwards until the end of the turn. They gain Dull, choose one forward, deal it 4,000 damage, which is a bit of a strange ability, but maybe you've got two little forwards that you don't want to attack with, you can't attack with because your opponent's got a big forward blocking the way. You can now at least Dull both of those guys to do your 4k to something and hopefully kill the big forward. 
So, Momody. Momody is great because if you give one of your forwards Brave and then you play Machinist, that forward can attack and then dull itself to do 4k to something on your opponent's field. Now you combine this with the likes of Ninja, you play Ninja onto the field, your forward now will deal 5k when it attacks, you give it Brave of Momody and again Machinist will give it the ability to dull and deal 4k, you attack with the forward, deals 5k, you dull it, it then deals uh, 4k so that's a total of 9k to one forward hopefully and also your opponent's got the attack to deal with further down the rabbit hole you combine this with ignacio um so you've got ignacio he attacks he'll deal 5k using ninja you get to draw a card you then dull him with uh, machinist's ability uh, to deal damage to another of your opponent's forwards and you gain a card from that and then obviously this is all using Brave for Mummody on Ignacio so your opponent still has the attack to contend with and regardless of whether or not they block it with a forward or they take the damage he will then draw you another card so that is three cards and obviously you will have paid four for both Ninja and Machinist but he will have definitely recurred the value there I think. Sid Highwind it's not a great card. Yeah, he's never been fantastic. Of all the mill cards, he's really not great. But if you want to try mill, then he's maybe just an on-curve forward. Um, and ultimately, if Sid is put from the field into the break zone and he breaks something else as well, you do get your, to mill your opponent two cards, which is not so bad. But if your opponent's got something small and you know they're not going to block with it, you can play Machinist to give Sid Highwind this ability, dull Sid to then break that little forward and your opponent will then mill two cards as well. Similarly with Rogue. Now Rogue I've been trying to get to work for a while but due to its low power it means it's quite awkward and the use of something like Hecaton Shear which forces two forces to deal each other their damage. Um, nine times out of ten Rogue would just die anyway so all you've really done is you've paid um, two CP for a summon which has dull and frozen your opponent's forward and you've sacrificed one of your own so not great but now being able to dull the rogue and deal 4,000 damage to uh, one of your opponent's forwards it then becomes dull and frozen because rogue deals damage to a forward and that's pretty good it's also good because you can have multiple rogues on your field as well and machinist gives two forwards that ability so maybe you can dull and freeze a couple of your opponent's forwards Okay, so the Crystal Exarch for the second time. Uh, at the beginning of your main phase 2, during each of your turns, you may play one forward of cost equal to or less than the number of ice backups you control from your hand onto the field. As I mentioned earlier, it can play a forward of any element, and it is restricted to only ice backups you control. So, White Tiger Lissi Kunmi. Make sure to protect him, because there's no point playing him, and then he just keeps on dying, right? Um, he He's not on curve, so he's a 4 CP 7k, which means he's a little bit under and a bit easier to kill as well. So you want to make sure that you are getting, you're squeezing your value out of this. Um, now you could combo this also with some com, uh, some aggro discard against your opponent to make sure to limit their options and what they can do to Crystal Exarch. But ultimately, you want to be able to protect him with the likes of White Tiger Let's see. Now, Devout, obviously, Crystal Exarch, it's when you go into your main phase 2 that his ability triggers. So you can go through your attack phase, and at the end of your attack phase, you break Devout to bring in Crystal Exarch, and then your opponent's got that moment then to decide whether or not they can break Crystal Exarch, because if they can't, and the instant you enter your main phase 2, even if they then decide to break him, he's still playing something onto the field because his ability's triggered. Now, obviously, Devout, you are putting an ice back up into the break zone, which then means that Crystal Exarch's ability to play something something of a higher value will go down. So if you've got four, four ice backups and you break Devout, he can now only play a three CP backup, so uh, three CP forward even. So just be wary of that sort of thing. And similarly, Scholar, and they're both Ingus, you can tell from the hair. Um, you uh, pay one ice, dull, put Scholar into the break zone, choose an ice forward of cost three or less in your break zone, add it to your hand. So similarly, if you're about to go into your main phase two and you've got Chris Lexark on the field, you can grab a forward out of your break zone to hand, ready to play him in main phase two. Herdy, again, you can find yourself something from your break zone. You just put Herdy into the break zone to get yourself something to hand and then play it with Chris Lexark. Now, this is good because Herdy can f fetch you something that's off color, so something like Iliwa, maybe. And again, you want to be careful with this because one, Herdy is obviously reducing the amount of ice backups you will be able to use to play. But it's also a case of if you are searching something off color, then you need to be careful that you don't have too many off color backups in your lineup anyway. But again, he can fetch something which might be to then be played with Crystal Exarch. Shantoto. So there's a 
a distinction here with gains and becomes, and there's a couple of cards we'll look at, but if Shantoto is on the field, it gains elements of fire, ice, wind, earth, lightning, and water. But weird that it says earth, I just realized that. <laughs> but um, she is primarily an earth card. She, in your hand, is an earth card. In your break zone, in your deck, she is an earth card. But as soon as she is on the field, she gains all those other elements. That means that she is then counted as an ice backup and works for Crystal Exarch. So even though she is an Earth card, she is also an ice backup and will count towards Crystal Exarch's count, which is good. And uh, yeah, so she gains, so she's as well as Princess Sarah, when Princess Center enters the field, name one element, Princess Sarah becomes that element. So again, you need to be careful because she becomes an ice backup, but she is no longer a light backup. She isn't any other backup, she is only ice. So these are the two distinctions you need to be wary of. But yeah, she can come onto the field and become an ice backup and that counts towards Crystal Exarch and then she's also got a fairly strong ability of all the forwards you control gain a thousand power if they share the element with Princess Seria, which again Crystal Exarch is probably going to be mono ice and she'll become ice and be able to buff everything. So a pretty strong ability and they work well together. Shelk. So, a card that Crystal Exarch might be able to play, um, it's not hard to get to three backups, hopefully, if your game's going well. Uh, and then, if you've got Crystal Exarch on the field, you play a main, main phase one, and then you get to your second main phase, you can play Shelk out of your hand, and then play something else. Now, obviously, Shelk stipulates that the forward it plays has to be of a different element wise. So, again, be careful with not muddying the waters too much with your ice deck, but she does need to play something that isn't ice. Now, it could be a light forward so you know you could have just a few couple of light forwards in there that work with shelk so something like light onion knight uh she can then play onto the field and what's happened is you've got crystal exarc shelk and whatever shelk plays and you've paid what the fourth crystal exarc and your opponent has to discard from shelk's ability which is you know that's just fantastic Celteus. So even though she is a fire ice card, the fire doesn't matter too much because Crystal Exarch can cheat her into the field. She then can remove any or as up to five ice forwards in your break zone and then reveal top four and then she can hopefully play something onto the field as well. Top five cards from your deck, sorry, not four. So yeah, Celteus being able to just play more for free and she's again not quite on curve, but I mean you've paid the four for Crystal Exarch and then you all you've done to uh, bring Celteus and something else into the field is just remove a few forwards from your break zone, which is pretty good going. And Lena. So these two work both ways. You can use Lena to bring Crystal Exarch onto the field, or you can use Crystal Exarch to bring Lena out of your hand onto the field. So it works quite well, but also these two work with the amount of backups you control, because both of them are dependent on the backups you control. When Lena enters the field, place one Arise Counter on Lena for each backup you control. And then obviously she can dull and remove however many Arise Counters to bring something out of the break zone onto the field. So both of these guys are quite heavily dependent on your backups and work quite well and synergize quite well. Okay. Ramza. The cost required to play Ramza on the field is reduced by one for each forward you control. It cannot become zero. For each forward other than Ramza you control, Ramza gains plus a thousand power. If Ramza has 10,000 power or more, Ramza gains haste, and when Ramza attacks, choose one forward, of course three or less your opponent controls, break it. Now he is a 6 CP forward and he is only 6,000 power, so he's not the best. But he's one of my favourite cards in the game, partially due to the fact of how much I just like Ramza as a character and I love Final Fantasy Tactics, but I think he can be quite fun and there's a lot of really cool ways to work around his limitations. So, Trion. Trion being on the field means that Ramza will cost one less, but also Trion not only buffs Ramza due to Ramza's ability, but the fact that Ramza is a knight means that Trion buffs him as well, and will make Ramza an 8k forward, which is nice. Jake, so if you've got Jake on the field, again Ramza will be a 5 CP forward, but as soon as Ramza enters with Jake on the field, Ramza gains plus 4000 power, meaning he's already got haste and he's ready to go swinging. Glorka. So Glorka reduces the costs of your lightning forwards, but also when a lightning forward or Glorka enters the field, choose a forward against plus a thousand power. So Glorka just being on the field alone reduces Ramza's cost by two CP, one for Ramza's ability, one for Glorka's. And then Ramza enters, he gains plus a thousand off of Glorka's ability, and he also gains plus a thousand just from his own ability. Um, so he already becomes an on curve 4 CP 8k forward. You can combine this with the likes of Trion as well to maybe reduce his cost even more. Or Beatrix. Beatrix, Glorka, and Ramza are a hell of a duo. 
So Beatrix has a zero cost ability during this turn. The cost required to cast your next job knight forward is reduced by two. It cannot become zero. You can only use this ability during your turn and only once per turn. And then when Beatrix or a job at knight enters the field, all the forwards you control gain plus 2,000 power until the end of the turn. Sorry, I did those abilities reverse just to confuse you. But yeah, what this really means is that Beatrix be on the field alone can use her zero cost ability to make Ramza just cost three, which is really, really good. But then when Ramza enters, obviously gains one from there being a forward down, but he also gains plus 2000 from Beatrix as well, which then makes him a 9k from just Beatrix being there, which is really good. Um, but if you've got the likes of Glorka, Glorka obviously will reduce Ramza once more and Beatrix can reduce it again. So... Glorka and Beatrix, two forwards, reduce Ramza by two, and then Glorka reduces by one, and Beatrix can uh, reduce by two. So that is a total of five CP reduction just for those two forwards being there and using their abilities. That's fantastic. And they all buff Ramza when he comes in, so then Ramza can just go nuts and kill things. Layla, so maybe you've just got a lightning water deck and playing Layla into Vikings will just increase the amount of forwards you've got on your field and make Ramza cost less, give him more power, you then play Ramza for less and you just go swinging. Obviously Layla and Vikings get you cards to hand as well which is really really good. Dusk, so as mentioned earlier, obviously being able to play Dusk onto the field and play something else just for one extra CP. That's really good, but then they obviously work against Ramza or work against his cost because then you've played Dusk, you've played something else that reduces Ramza's cost by two already. And if you've already got forwards on the field as well, maybe you've got a Glorka um, or a Beatrix, Ramza's just going to be super cheap and he's going to be really big when he comes in. Regis, and you can't mention Regis without Kefka. So when Regis enters the field, choose up to two forwards other than card name Regis, light or dark. Put them in the uh, put in the break zone from the field during this turn. Play them onto the field, and then obviously Kefka. You can put three forwards you control into the break zone to just play Kefka. So say you've got Ramza and another forward, maybe Beatrix on the field, and something else. You put those three into the break zone to play Kefka, and say your opponent's got a fell Thanos. You know it's really screwing with a lot of your deck. Kefka can break him. Yay! And then you say crack your Star Sybil to then bring in Regis. You can then bring back in Ramza and either Glorka or Beatrix or something like that. And all of a sudden Ramza's just gone up to being a 10k forward again. That's got haste. That can break a 3 CP forward and just go swinging. So, you yeah, know, pretty good going. All right, there we are, folks. I hope you enjoyed this week's weird and wonderful combos. Let me know in the comment section some of the weird combos you've been playing. Obviously, I've been doing a lot of Opus 12 recently, um, so let me know some of the fun things you found in Opus 12 as well. Um, sorry that the videos have been kind of infrequent recently. I've got a lot on my plate at the moment. I am doing, having a look at a lot of different weird projects that I can try and dip my toes into. There's a behind the card video or series I'm working on, so kind of describing characters and their relation or the cards and their relation to what characters do and the events in the games they're from and then there's also a tutorial potentially in the works as well so kind of describing the in-depth workings of the game and using good examples of why things are the way they are anyway i'll see you guys in the next video